Attention viewer, your beliefs are under threat. Until now, video recordings have been a rare source of reliable information. When you saw a video of a politician planning a conspiracy, you could believe your eyes. But advances in technology have made it possible to produce hyper-realistic fake videos. These so-called deepfakes are a threat to our way of life. When we cannot believe our eyes, we will lose contact with reality. In fact, we face the threat of an epistemic apocalypse. We need to invest in technological systems to label, detect and eradicate this information pollution. Look, even I'm not a real person, but the threat that I'm warning about is real. <coughs> okay, that was weird. Anyway, I'm Joshua Habgood Coote, and we're here to chat about deepfakes and how worried we ought to be about them. For a few years now, we've seen deepfake videos that bring warnings about quite how dangerous they are. We've been warned about deepfakes by Barack Obama, by Elizabeth Windsor, Morgan Freeman, and Tom Cruise. These videos are pretty spooky. There's something really uncanny about seeing one person's face morph into another. And the occasional glitches in these videos remind you that you're watching counterfeit people. You might have noticed that our would-be deepfake Cassandra wasn't particularly realistic. Now, we didn't set out to produce a bad deepfake, but the pixelation and weirdness in this video should give you some idea of what's currently achievable by non-specialists working on a pretty short time frame. Comparing the quality of this video with the claims of imminent catastrophe it makes should make us think twice about what I'm going to call the epistemic apocalypse narrative. So that's our goal for the rest of the video, to take a critical look at the epistemic apocalypse narrative and see whether it holds up. I want to highlight three claims that are central to this narrative. The deepfakes will undermine our knowledge generating practices, the deepfakes are historically unprecedented, and that the solutions to deepfakes will be technological. So sometimes it's fun to be spooked out by scary scenarios, but it's reached the point that we need to work out whether we need to take warnings about the epistemic apocalypse seriously. A faked recording is going to fundamentally disrupt our knowledge producing practices, or a deepfake video is just another overhyped technology which is looking around for a commercial application. Watch out visual effects artists. Drawing on arguments from my recent paper, Deepfakes and the Epistemic Apocalypse, I'm going to argue that we've got a distorted view of the problems posed by deepfakes. Many of the warnings about deepfake videos are based on mistaken views about both the history and the epistemology of recordings. And I'm going to argue that deepfakes are fundamentally a social problem and not a technological problem. Right, expertise disclaimer. I'm a philosopher. I'm not a computer scientist or a futurologist. I mainly work in epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy that studies what knowledge is and how we can get it. I'm not going to get into the details of deepfake technology or make predictions about the future. Rather, I'm going to focus on conceptual claims about the way we gain knowledge from videos and claims about the historical progression of recording technology. Cool, let's get going. Part one, the social epistemology of videos. Let's start with the claim that deepfakes will undermine our knowledge generating practices. To think about this claim, we need to understand how recordings give us knowledge. Lots of writers have thought that there's something special about photographs and in fact about recordings in general, and in particular about the way that they relate to reality. Think about the differences between a photograph and a drawing. Unlike a camera, an artist can lie. They can make a picture more appealing by adding in details or by changing the composition. This is an etching of the House of Gettysburg hero John Burns from 1863, alongside the photograph that it was copied from. You can see that although the etching is labelled as photographed by Brady, the artist has added in various details to improve the composition. The possibility of lying means that photographs and drawings involve different kinds of reliance. When we rely on a photograph to give us an accurate picture of the world, we don't seem to rely on the photographer's beliefs. They might not have even noticed that there's a woman standing outside the door in this scene. But when we rely on a drawing, we need to rely on the artist to have accurate beliefs about the scene in front of them, and have the competence and sincerity to accurately communicate these beliefs through a picture. Susan Sontag nicely sums up this distinction between drawings and photographs, saying that whereas the painter constructs, the photographer discloses. More recently, the philosopher Dan Cavendon-Taylor has argued that we should understand the distinction between photographs and pictures in terms of different kinds of knowledge. He argues 
that photographs provide us with direct perceptual knowledge, whereas drawings only provide us with indirect testimonial knowledge, in which we must rely on the artist to be telling us the truth. Philosophers absolutely love to make distinctions, so why does this one matter to understanding deepfakes? To see why, we need to look at the clearest articulation of the threat of deepfakes, which comes from the work of the philosopher Regina Rinne. Rinne argues that the special status of recordings is important because it enables them to provide a backstop to other sources of knowledge, like knowledge from testimony. In her view, the threat of deepfakes is that they will destroy the special status of knowledge from recordings, thereby undercutting this backstop role. If faked recordings are all around us, we will have to start relying on the people who produce those recordings not to be fooling us with hyper-realistic fakes. When we can't tell apart pictures from real cameras and pictures that are produced by fancy applied statistics, AI techniques, we must rely on the person who shows us a recording to be showing us a real photograph or a real video. If we have to rely on the photographer or the person who shows us a photograph, recordings transform from perceptual knowledge into testimony. This is bad news because recordings need to be non-testimonial to act as the backstop for other epistemic practices. In Rinne's view, the downgrading of recordings from perceptual knowledge into testimonial knowledge involves not just a quantitative shift in how much evidence we can gain from recordings, but a qualitative shift which kicks out one of the foundations of our epistemic system. This all sounds very compelling. If we think that the difference between recordings and pictures is that recordings don't involve relying on people, and pictures do. But I don't think that's the right way to think about the way we get knowledge from recordings. Think about the way we form beliefs based on other kinds of instruments. I can look at this clock and see that it's quarter past 10. Gain a justified belief about what time it is. It doesn't feel like I have to rely on anyone else to form this belief in the way that I'd have to if producer Jake told me that it's a quarter past 10. But a clock is an artifact. It's a thing designed and built to have a particular function, telling the time. When I use a clock to tell what time it is, I'm relying on this function to be working properly. This means that I'm implicitly relying on the people who designed and built the clock to have done their jobs right, as well as on the owner to have changed the battery. This kind of reliance is different from testimony. I'm relying on a group of people and not on one individual, but it's still a kind of social reliance. Recording devices like video cameras are artifacts too. So relying on the outputs of recording technology also seems like it involves relying on a group of people. Those who are involved in the recording process, the designers of a camera, the manufacturers, photographers, printers, editors, and so on. Why does this matter? Well, if you think that relying on a photograph or a video involves relying on a social practice, learning that some people are creating fake recordings is bad news, but it's not a disaster. You've learned that some people involved in the social practice of making and sharing recordings and making fakes and sharing them as if they were real. That suggests that there are some problems in the social practice, maybe enough problems to downgrade the amount of evidence you can get from recordings, but it doesn't mean that recordings shift what kind of evidence they provide. Once you recognise that recording technology has always involved reliance on groups of people, the fact that deepfakes create a need to rely on people not to share fake videos isn't an epistemic catastrophe. It's continuous with other kinds of problems in photographic practice. Okay, on to the history. Part two, the history of fake recordings. But wait, says our deepfake Cassandra. The problem with deepfakes isn't like a badly designed camera or a poorly thought through development process. Deepfakes are historically unprecedented. We've never had to deal with cheap, widespread and super realistic faked images and videos before. In deepfakes and the infocalypse, infopocalypse, Nina Schick, claims that, until relatively recently, the manipulation of media, photos, video and audio, was the domain of specialists or those with immense resources, like a national government or a Hollywood studio. Deepfake technology is still nascent, but we are in the early stages of an AI revolution that will completely transform the representations of reality through media. Right, that sounds like an empirical claim. Deepfakes are historically unprecedented. Let's heat up our library cards and see whether that claim is backed up by the history of photography. Luckily, we don't have to go too far into the stacks. In Faking It, manipulated photography before Photoshop, Mia Feynman gives us an accessible overview of the history of photographic faking. 
and it turns out that people have been faking recordings for quite a while. In 1846, Richard Calvert-Jones set off on a trip around the Mediterranean. Jones had learned photography from its English inventor, William Fox Talbot, and he took various colour types on his travels. Now, like any amateur photographer, he wasn't always happy with the results. Here's a picture of four Capuchin friars, which Jones took in Malta. Looks normal, except in the original picture there were five friars. After exposing the negative, Jones was unhappy with the composition, so he painted over the negative to remove the surplus friar. This kind of retouching wasn't uncommon. Many photographs from portrait studios were painted to add colour and to beautify the sitters. In fact, in the late 19th century, it wasn't at all unusual for photography businesses to employ artists full-time to touch up negatives. Some faked photographs have intriguing echoes of current concerns about political deepfakes. In the aftermath of the Paris Commune in 1871, the photographer Eugène Appert produced a series of face-swapped photographs entitled Les Crimes de la Commune. These photographs combined staged photographs with stock portraits of key players in the Commune, creating pretty plausible images of supposed atrocities carried out by the Communards, which were sold as photographs after the fact. Concerns about deepfake pornography are also precedented. The New York Evening Graphic, nicknamed the Pornographic, was notorious in the early 20th century for producing composite photographs, known as composographs, to illustrate their gossip stories. In this composograph, we see a scene from the scandalous romance between Peaches Browning and Edward West, Daddy Browning, complete with the African goose that Daddy supposedly kept in their bedroom. Faked videos have an equally long history. In 1900, the French filmmaker Georges Méliès released a short film entitled L'Homme Orchestre, which by combining exposures shows him splitting into seven versions of himself to play instruments together. More seriously, during the Spanish-American War in 1898, several staged videos were passed off as real, including footage of toy ships, which were passed off as a real naval battle. So fake recordings aren't a new thing, but our deepfake Cassandra might suggest that it is unprecedented to have ubiquitous faked recordings. Okay, so this is another empirical claim, and it also looks false. It turns out that in the United States at the end of the 19th century, printing technology hadn't yet caught up with photography. This meant that it wasn't possible to directly print photographs in newspapers. Instead, what readers at the time saw illustrating their stories were etchings that were copied by hand from photographs. Inevitably, these artists had significant incentives to liven up their pictures, just as writers punched up the details of their stories at the time. Both wanted to sell papers. When the introduction of new printing techniques allowed photographs to be directly printed, newspaper workers kept tweaking all of their photographs. This was hardly a secret. Professional photographers defended faking in trade journals, arguing that it allowed the portrayal of truth. Not literal truth, but spiritual and eternal truth. This looks not unlike the worst case scenario for the epistemic apocalypse. So two questions. Did Americans in the late 19th century fundamentally lose contact with reality? Well, no, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that they did. And how did newspaper editors deal with this widespread practice of faking? Well, they certainly didn't have a technological solution to the problem. The historian Andy Tucher argues that the problem of faking was addressed by a social norm against tweaking photographs, which was associated with a shift in the associations of the term faking from a neutral or even positive term into a term of criticism. This underlines the importance of social practices to our reliance on technology. The reliability of newspaper photographs in the late 20th century wasn't a technological achievement, it was a collective social achievement of photographers and newspaper editors who instituted and maintained the social norms of good journalistic practice. So, strike two against the epistemic apocalypse. Deepfakes are very much precedented, and even widespread faked photographs didn't lead to the epistemic apocalypse. It's important to pause here for a second. The fact that we've dealt with a faked photograph since the beginning of photography doesn't mean that they're not a problem. Some problems are just very old. Part three, social problems, technological solutions. So let's turn to the last part of the epistemic apocalypse narrative. The claim that the solutions to deepfakes will be technological. In Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, data journalist Meredith Broussard introduces the idea of techno-chauvinism. She defines techno-chauvinism as the belief that 
tech is always a solution, and claims that this view is often associated with libertarianism, free speech absolutism, the belief in the objectivity of computer systems, and a certain kind of techno-utopianism. As I understand it, techno-chauvinism combines a tendency to transform social problems into technological problems with an unjustified optimism in the power, reliability, and efficiency of technological systems. To see how these two elements of techno-chauvinism work together, consider an example. Imagine you're a city council trying to address a difficulty tenants have in finding rental accommodation. A typical techno-chauvinist solution has two stages. The first stage is to propose a reframing of the problem that is apt for technological solution. For example, framing the problem as la renters' lack of access to information about rental properties, rather than the city's lack of housing. Once this reframing of the problem is in place, it's relatively easy to show how it can be solved through an automated technological system. An app that collates listings, for example, an automated matching system, or an online reputation system. And now this is especially true if you make inflated and over-optimistic claims about what this technological system can do. Both academic and popular writing about deepfakes relies on both parts of techno-chauvinism. For starters, there's a lot of inflated claims about what the technology can do. We're often told that hyper-realistic deepfakes can be made by anyone with a touch of a button. Now look, there are some pretty impressive videos that employ deepfake technology, but the majority of amateur deepfakes are pretty janky, and the super-realistic videos rely on significant human skills to pull off. You need a pretty good impersonator and a very skilled video production team. If you search for deepfake videos on YouTube or Reddit, most of the examples you find will either be out of time or will have an obvious difference in pixelation between the face and the rest of the scene. When we turn to the proposed solutions to deepfakes, there is a clear slant towards technological interventions. A great deal of time is being given to arguments for technological fixes, including various automated detection systems and watermarking systems. While it is true that media education and critical thinking are often discussed alongside these technological fixes, the focus is almost always on raising awareness about the threat of the epistemic apocalypse as a way to gather support for funding these technological fixes. Now, in fact, these warnings about the threat of deepfakes might do more harm than they prevent. A slew of well-produced videos from reliable sources telling you that you can't believe your eyes are much more likely to lead to a blanket skepticism about video evidence than a couple of faked videos are. In fact, there's a real risk that videos warning about the threat of losing touch with reality will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. What's really striking about the proposed solutions to deepfakes is that the problem is always framed as how to deal with one particular kind of technologically enabled misinformation. It's not obvious that we should be designing our media institutions around one kind of faked content. It might be better if we started by thinking about what the general goals of media institutions are, plausibly to provide reliable information about questions people care about, before moving on to think about how media institutions can meet those goals. It might well turn out that the best measure for addressing deepfakes is simply having well-funded and reliable media institutions. So it looks like the discussions of the solutions to deepfakes are distorted in two ways. The problem space is set up to favour technological solutions rather than social reform in our media institutions. And our sense of what the problems are posed by deepfakes is informed by an inflated view of what these technological systems can do. What we should be thinking about is how to set up social norms against misleading faking in the vein of US newspapers at the turn of the 20th century and about how to manage the human skills required to make convincing deepfakes. In fact, we might even think about uninventing those skills. And we shouldn't just be thinking about deepfakes, but about more general issues about the design of our epistemic institutions. Part four, conclusion. So, where does that leave us? We started off with three parts of the epistemic apocalypse narrative. The deepfakes are a threat, which is unprecedented, and which can only receive technological solutions. Firstly, because reliance on technology always involves social reliance, the existence of faked videos and photographs doesn't fundamentally transform the way we gain knowledge from recordings. Secondly, faked photographs and videos are not a categorically new phenomenon, and there are some important historical lessons to be learned about how to handle widespread faking. And finally, when we're thinking about solutions to deepfakes, and other technological problems, 
we shouldn't accept either inflated claims about what technological systems can do, or allow social problems to be transformed into technological problems. Thanks for watching.